and I think we should uh, go ahead and go. So, um, hi, uh, this is Marshall Peter, the director of CADRE, the National Center on Dispute Resolution in Special Education, and I want to welcome you to part two um, of Inclusive Listening, Building Understanding, Supporting Collaboration, another in a series of CADRE webinars. Um, our presenters today are Lorig Charcutian and Erica Bridgeford, who come to us from Community Mediation Maryland. Lorig Charcutian, PhD, is the Executive Director of Community Mediation Maryland. Her work includes developing partnerships with state agencies, including the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Service, Maryland State Department of Education, Family Court Administration, and others to bring collaborative conflict resolution to new and unique forums. Lorig serves as a trainer and provides technical assistance to the 17 community-based mediation programs serving Maryland. Lorig's research examines the impact of specific aspects of the mediation process on experiences for participants, as well as broader cost-benefit analysis of community mediation. Erica Bridgeford is the Director of Training for Community Mediation Maryland. In this capacity, she provides training to the 18 community mediation centers in Maryland, as well as to state agencies and organizations. She has provided advanced skills training to mediators at the Maryland Human Relations Commission for federal EEOC mediators, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and at many national conferences. Prior to coming to Community Mediation Maryland, Erica was a case manager at Community Mediation in Baltimore City, giving her a unique insight into the challenges of working with people in conflict from the beginning of a referral through the completion of the mediation. Erica was promoted to Director of Training and Volunteer Development, where she's trained, mentored, evaluated, and supervised both new and experienced mediators. And so we are delighted to have Erica and Laura with us today. Please uh, take it away. Great. Thanks. Happy to be here. So um, this is very exciting to be doing part two. I just will say a few words about what it means to be doing part two. First, I am hoping that everybody who is on the line had a chance to practice these skills over the holidays. I know I did. You can do it with your family. You can do it with anybody. Um, so what we've done is we've, we're building on part one. I'm hoping everybody had a chance to see part one, either live or had a chance to look at it before they came on, because we're going to just do a very brief review before we go into practice. <clears throat> one of the things that we tried to do was take some of the questions that folks had in part one or some of the examples people seemed to be asking for uh, when we did part one and incorporate them into part two. So what we're going to do in just a second is start by reviewing, very quickly, reviewing um, in inclusive listening. And then we're going to do some practice where folks will have a chance to actually uh, take a look at uh, the example and figure out what feelings, values, and topics they would pull out of it. And we'll discuss the results of that. And then we'll close by talking about some of the different ways that inclusive listening can be incorporated into collaborative problem solving and um, facilitation and mediation and meetings and so on. So that's our process for today. And I'm going to hand it to Erica to start our uh, inclusive listening. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we're going to just take a review of, um, in general, what inclusive listening is. So we like to say that this is the way we do non-judgmental. We talk about being non-judgmental and listening in a non-judgmental way, and inclusive listening is the way that we do that. And so um, for the overview, um, right this here. OK. So. Um, inclusive listening in a nutshell. So it's the process of taking a positional statement. So when someone is venting about something, when there's a challenging conversation, the person's position is from where they sit in the conflict. And generally that position is filled with blame language and victimhood and that sort of thing. And so in order to listen to that in a way where you can work on understanding without judgment, inclusive listening is one way to do that, where you're listening 
focusing on what feelings you hear the person expressing, what topics, what things they're saying they have conflict about, and then also what's important to them. Yes. So taking a look at, oops, we both went. Taking a look at um, feelings expressed, this is where we should be capturing the intensity of what's going on. Um, if people are repeating themselves, it means they don't feel heard. And one way for people to feel heard is to express feelings. So one of the clues we give if it seems like someone's repeating themselves, you want to take a look at what feelings are they expressing that aren't being heard. Um, there was some conversation in the end of the last webinar that we did about, well, what if people are screaming and yelling, or what if people are cursing or behaving inappropriately? And it's uh, our general sense is that for shifts and transformation to occur, people need to act in an authentic way, like a real way, and feel heard and not judged in that real place, as opposed to act and behave, quote unquote, properly because we've told them to. And so when we use these strategies in mediations and meetings and facilitations, when people are screaming and yelling and cursing, we work on understanding. And often, the first thing we're going to work on understanding are feelings. So when there is that level of intensity, we're going to be especially aware of and paying attention to feelings. And then we're also listening for topics. So this is where you often hear people say you have to separate the personalities from the issues. Well, because we live in America and when you say the word issues, people freak out and think you need medication. We say topics because these are specifically the things people are saying that they have conflict about. So what's important is that you want to name these topics in a way that avoid your judgment of what the problem is, that removes um, people's blame language, and it just focuses on what they want to make plan, plans about concretely. And so one way to make sure you have a good topic that's not going to make things worse and isn't going to take a side is to run it through what we call the topics grinder. So you want to know, is this thing something that someone actually said they have conflict about, not your suggestion about what they should be making a plan about, but something they talked about making having conflict around. The way you name the thing, it should be specific or concrete. The word shouldn't blame anyone, so it shouldn't be something that's loaded with what someone thinks is wrong with the other person, and it shouldn't take anyone's side. It also shouldn't set up a dynamic of, yes, someone should be doing this thing, or no, someone shouldn't be doing this thing. So things that are someone's suggestion, like cleaning the house, um, would not be something that's the topic. So you can see there at the bottom some examples of things that would be concrete things that, that would pass the grinder would be things like parking, communication, schedule, clothing, dog, food, activity, guest, mornings, homework. So, and then that values. Okay, so taking a look at values or what's important, this is the stuff that we have as goals. So um, in thinking about what uh, when we listen to people blame or insult other people, there's usually somewhere in there something that's important to them that's not getting met. So in the midst of the blame and the insult, we're listening for what is this person saying they want out of this situation. <clears throat> and so um, one of the, the things that we like to highlight is we want to be careful with the word values is because sometimes it sounds like it's a loaded word. So values is one way to think about it. What's important uh, is another way to think about it. And here we just have this quick example that um, you want to be careful that when you're listening, you're not thinking about what's important to you, but you're really listening to what is this person saying is important. And so in this quick example, this person is saying, um, because she slashed my tire, she needs to get what was coming to her. Since I went through having to miss work and get my car fixed, she should have to see what it feels like. So that's right. I put a brick through her windshield. So a lot of us. Um, would listen to that and think, oh my gosh, this person has no values. Or we'd listen to it and we'd think, oh, those, you know, I don't know what values she's talking about. She, wants, she just wants revenge or payback. Um, and what she's saying is you know, she needs to understand what I went through. And here's my sense of justice and fairness. So even if it's not our sense of justice or fairness, if we're listening deeply to what this person is articulating, then we would identify in this statement understanding justice and fairness um, as the values. So that's a quick review. And again, if you're joining us for the first time, you can uh, at some point go back online and see we spent the entire time sort of doing what we last time, doing what we just did in 10 minutes. 
So you could go back and take a look at that if you feel like this was too fast for you. We're going to move on to really looking at um, practicing it. And uh, so here we go with uh, the first question. One of the questions that somebody asked was about note taking. Someone asked about that at the last, uh, the last webinar that we did. So what we did is we set up this first slide in a way that reflects the way that I would take notes. So for example, the, this is what the IEP chair is saying in this meeting. And my notes would look like I wouldn't actually have written down what the, what the person said, but I would have this cross on my notepad. And while this person was talking, I would be writing down the feelings that I heard, the values that I heard, and the topics that I heard. So let's take a look at this. So the IEP chair is saying, you know, at this point, we've brought the best technology, most current methods, and some of the best trained teachers to Daniel's program. We are totally committed to Daniel's progress, and we know he can make great progress. But we can't teach children who are not in school. We've had this conversation over and over again. We've reviewed the data with you. Looking at it now, Daniel has six absences and was tardy 12 times in the last quarter, sometimes missing half the day. That's too much. You complain about Daniel not making progress, and you have inappropriately criticized my staff members. But this is a partnership. You need to get Daniel to school, or we can't teach him. And so, if you're going to, so that's the person's position. And what you're listening for is what the feelings were that were expressed. So, again, avoiding your opinion of what the person is feeling. And so, here you're looking especially at what we call a clean translation from things that the person said to feelings that were actually expressed, with not too much um, explanation in your brain about how you got that feeling. So, we have words like that he's, he's expressing or she is expressing that they're feeling dedicated, proud, confident, exasperated, disrespected, protective, set up, and also hopeful. So notice that there's a mix of what you might call the negative drama feelings with also the positive feelings like dedicated, proud, and hopeful. So we're listening deeply to all of it, not just the pieces that we think are conflict. And then also we have what's important, and so um, this person is expressing that partnership is important to them, that follow through and accountability, respect are things that they're looking for, um, progress and availability and opportunity are also things that are important to them. And then, so while there's a lot going on with the intangible kinds of things, with the feelings that they're expressing and what's important to them, concretely the things that they're saying they're having conflicts about in a way that's not going to blame anyone um, are attendance and then about the way communication has been happening. So before we move on to the parent, which is we're going to take a look at next, I just want to highlight that when I'm just coming back to this note-taking piece that, that people had questions about, if I were listening to this chair saying these things, I would take all of these notes. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to have an opportunity to use every single feeling word I write down and every single value word I write down. But what I want to sort of lean towards is getting everything that I do here. And then later, if I'm going to do a reflection or if I'm going to build a set of goals for the group for them to think about how they could accomplish, I want to have all of these um, possibilities written down, everything I heard on my notes, so that then later uh, I can decide which pieces of it I'm going to bring back in in a, in a reflection that I might do or in a, a question that I might ask or in a set of goals that we might be setting as a group. The other thing that I just want to highlight is when I do take my notes, I mean, you'll look at this. This is literally all that I would have. So because I'm coming in as a facilitator, I don't have any when I'm, when I'm facilitating IEP meetings, for example, which is what this would be. Um, I don't have the responsibility to um, track content, right? There's someone else taking notes at the table with the content. So I don't need to write down 12 tardies, six absences, half the day, you know, whatever. I don't, that, that, that content stuff I don't actually need because what I'm doing is I'm working on supporting them to have a dialogue and them to, to resolve uh, their conflict. So I know there's people who are playing lots of different roles in IEP meetings or in other meetings on this call. Um, but when I'm coming in as a facilitator, I'm, just in the role or mediator, and I'm just in the role of um, supporting quality dialogue, the notes that I would take would literally just be the feelings, values, and topics that you sort of see on here. 
So then um, we move on to the mother, and she says, do you have any idea about what it takes to get Daniel moving in the morning? He's getting bigger now, and I'm a small woman. I have to get him bathed and dressed and into his chair, and don't get me started on feeding breakfast. As he gets older, he can resist more if he's feeling cranky. I'm doing this all by myself, and some days it's just too much. Then I come in here, and you all sit there all high and mighty and tell me I'm not doing a good enough job and that it's my fault he's not making progress. So now we listen for feelings overwhelmed, exhausted, insulted, judged, misunderstood, alone, and blamed. And so some of those feeling words are um, intense, right? And so the idea is we really want to make sure we're meeting people where they are. Um, the, so just a word about this particular dialogue comes out of a meeting that I facilitated. And what was so interesting about it is that in it, the mother said, um, essentially this. I mean, this was, this was sort of how the conflict started. And before I had a chance to jump in, one of the participants in the meeting said, really attempting to be very helpful, said, oh, we know exactly how you feel. We know it's hard. And the effect that that had is the mother got more outraged because she was essentially saying that you don't know how I feel. You don't, you, and whether or not the person who said that did or didn't know how she felt and whether that person themselves maybe had a child at home that needed this level of care um, is sort of irrelevant because this mother was feeling alone and blamed and judged and misunderstood. And until that was honored, um, she couldn't move on to thinking about problem solving. So when I had a chance to jump in, um, I was able to reflect these feelings that we have here on the page. And as the mother started feeling heard, she was able to shift to engage in problem solving. And the solutions that the group came to were uh, involved bringing the mother um, and the family a lot more support. So these supports were available in the community. But because of this inability to have this dialogue where people felt heard and understood, even though the resources were there, the resources couldn't come into the conversation because people were feeling judged and misunderstood. So it was a really good example of where people feeling heard because their feelings were reflected without judgment um, gave them a chance to then let go of that intensity and be ready to do the problem solving. And then those other resources that were available could sort of come into this family's um, situation. So then we go on to uh, values, what's important, recognition, understanding, support, and awareness. And then um, the topics as we frame them here are mornings and communication. So then moving on, so uh, just talking a little bit more about, so we have, so my notes would initially look like this. I'm tracking what the chair said, and I'm tracking them this way. And then I'm tracking what the mother said, and I'm tracking it this way. And then when I want to start to put it all together, I can track it this way. So some people take all of their notes this way. I usually start with the two earlier versions I showed you, and then I move on to this. But what this helps us see is now we're organizing the conflict in terms of what are the topics, and then what's important, and what are the feelings that everybody has. And so now the um, chair talked about attendance. So attendance and mornings are clearly related, but in this case, we're framing them as, as, uh, as separate topics, at least for now, until we find out more about the situation. And then we have the chair's feelings in terms of attendance. And then they both talked about communication, and we have each of their feelings and values in terms of communication. And then they talked about, and then the mother talked about mornings, and so we know what some of her feelings and values are in terms of mornings. And the, nice thing about this is that it sets us up for the joint collaborative problem solving that we're going to do later on in the process. And after we do some practice together, um, you'll, you'll get a chance to see sort of how we would put all these pieces together in a, you know, to do sort of joint uh, collaborative problem solving. The other thing that this tells us is we can see if there's a topic that's been raised that we haven't heard from somebody about. So before we go on to start problem solving around attendance, we would want to make sure we heard the mother's feelings and values about attendance, right? So this tells us when I have this chart set up, I can look and I can say, oh, okay, we don't know this person's feelings and values about this topic. And so it's a clue to me that I've got to ask an open-ended question, what are your thoughts about attendance, um, to the, the person who I haven't heard from. So that's the other value to this, this particular uh, structure of, uh, of the note-taking, whether you take the notes initially this way or whether you move your notes from the crosses earlier into, into this structure here. Okay. All right, so get your pens and pads ready. 
for just your brains, put your thinking caps on. So now it's your turn. We're going to look at um, different events, and then you're going to pick out what feelings you hear, what that what's important, what do you hear that's important that's being expressed, and then also what the topics are that people are talking about. And this is going to be multiple choice, and there's going to be a box that pops up for you to choose which um, feelings and values and topics you think you hear. So we're going to do it piece by piece. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, so in this first one, um, the participant says the bottom line is that if we don't bite the bullet and implement appropriate zoning to limit development in the rural parts of this county, then we'll have insane sprawl with all of its negative implications. The septics everywhere are terrible for the watershed. We lose the agricultural character of this county, and providing services to residents sprawled all over the county is not an efficient use of tax money not to mention the environmental impact of the pollution associated with the increased traffic to and from the metro centers and the big box stores that will then start popping up all over the currently rural areas. I want my kids and grandkids to be able to enjoy the same beautiful county I grew up in, to swim in the rivers and play in the fields. So your choices, and you can see that box popped up over in the upper right-hand corner, we have A, worried, B, lost, C, anxious, D, committed, E, nostalgic, and inefficient. So you're working on, so you can take as many as you want, right? So there's not this one right answer. What you're doing is what feelings are expressed by the participant, a clean translation, not what you think they must be feeling or what your opinion of what they're feeling or analysis is, what do they actually express is what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to broadcast the results now. So pencils down. <laughs> All right. And so here you can see thumbs up. You did it. You got the feelings. It's the feelings that were expressed. So wow, 100% got way. That was A. And then C is anxious. So we got 66.6%. .6 and then D. 61.9% was committed, so that's pretty good. Um, and then, oh, we scroll down. I didn't realize there's more in the box. Okay. So we're going to talk about the rest of these and checking out why these other ones aren't feelings that the speaker actually expressed. So when you take a look at loss, the speaker did talk about losing things, but they didn't express that they personally were feeling lost. And so we want to be careful that just because you may hear a person say a word that sounds like a feeling to you, um, but not to confuse that with an actual feeling that's being expressed. And then nostalgic would be you listen to this person talk and you go, oh, he's nostalgic about, you know, one about the rivers and um, and that sort of thing. And so, but that person didn't actually express that that's what they're feeling. And then inefficient isn't actually a, an emotion. So that would be um, the speaker, what they think the potential problem is going to be is that something's going to be inefficient. So we don't want to take the speaker's blame and say, oh, that's something that they feel. So in our society, we do a lot of somebody feels that or feels like, and then we it's a repeat of what they think is wrong. So inefficient would be an example of that. He feels like something is inefficient. So that's not an actual emotion right there. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at um, the other person in this conversation who says, it's fine for you to sit there. And again, so what you may want to do even before you look down at this or if you can control yourself and not look at the, at the uh, options we gave you, try just listening to it and writing and think, okay, what, what are the feelings I'm hearing as, as you know, I'm hearing this? being said. It's fine for you to sit there and say you want to protect the agricultural character of this county while you've got your retirement account nicely squared away. But the farmers have been farming their whole lives, are ready to retire, and don't have a fund. Their fund is their farm. You show up here with those maps drawing arbitrary lines, and you have no idea whose lives you are ruining. If you downsize this county, you'll crush their property values. 
not only will they not be able to sell it to developers, the price they would get to sell it to other farmers will fall through the floor. And their kids, who are just getting started in farming, won't be able to leverage the value of the farm for credit to buy farm equipment because the land won't be worth anything. That's a hell of a way to protect the agricultural character of this county. OK, so here's your box. And you can uh, start to pick insulted, worried, ruined, crushed, hypocritical, protective, discounted. And um, so just a, just a quick clue, think about what is this person saying they are feeling, right? So not necessarily what are they saying on behalf of someone else, how someone else might be feeling, what are they expressing that they're feeling, right? That's what we're listening for. And sometimes when we're talking about larger policy disputes, we have to be really careful that we're listening to this individual speaking and not what they're saying about other people. How they feel about other people, yes, but not how they're saying other people might be feeling. So. Let's take a look. Pencils down. We have got insulted. Good. Many of you had that. Uh, worried. Yes. Um, stop changing your answers now. <laughs> People are in there changing their answers. It's okay because we can't say who you are. We can't see who you are. So no consequences. Um, protective. Yes. And we have here that discounted. Um, so discounted is an unusual one, and yet that's in there because he's sort of saying that this approach and this perspective um, is being pushed to the side. So let's take a look at the other ones. Um, we have uh, ruined is what he's saying is that these other people in our community, their livelihoods will be ruined, right? So that, that's what he's saying the outcome is going to be of these plans that you're putting out there. He hasn't said that he feels or she feels ruined. Um, crushed is, again, it's a word. It, so crushed could be a feeling. But where we want to be careful when we're listening for feelings is sometimes people will say, um, say a word that is a feeling word, but they're not using it uh, to describe how they feel. And crushed is an example. What he actually said, if we go take a look, was um, somewhere in there, something about that you'll crush their property values. So he's describing what's going to happen to property values. So that's not, he's, saying, he's not saying that he was devastated, crushed, personally feeling that way. And hypocritical, again, that's the speaker's accusation. So uh, coming back to the concept that like is never a feeling, right? So he would say, you'd be, you're, what you may be thinking if you selected hypocritical is um, uh, he feels like the others in the room are being hypocritical. Um, that's a statement of his position. That is, in fact, what he's articulating. But that's not a feeling. So that's, that wouldn't be a, um, that's an accusation. That's not how he's feeling. OK, so, um, so we've got our two feeling pieces. Incidentally, one of the requests that someone had in the last, um, in the last uh, session that we did was uh, examples of how this could work in public policy. So here you have a public policy example. Um, and after we get through it, I'm going to talk about uh, this is based off of one that I did. And um, so after we get through this, I'll talk a little bit about how we use strategic listening in this specific example. So now we're going to shift the values. OK, so we're going to read it again. So now um, we're back to participant one. And now you're working on understanding what's important to the speaker, um, removing their blame of what's wrong with the other person, but what they want. So the bottom line is that if we don't and implement appropriate zoning to limit development in the rural parts of this county, then we'll have insane sprawl with all of its negative implications. The septics are terrible for the watershed. We lose the agricultural character of this county, and providing services to residents sprawled all over the county is not an efficient use of tax money. Not to mention the environmental impact of the pollution associated with the increased traffic to and from the metro centers and the big box stores that will then popping up all over the currently rural areas. I want my kids and grandkids to be able to enjoy the same beautiful county I grew up in, to swim in the rivers and play in the fields. So your choice is working on understanding what they're expressing is important to them. You have A, efficiency, B, clean water, C, appropriateness, D, control, E, clean air, F, beauty, G, limiting sprawl, H, legacy, I, small businesses. So take a second to do that so we have a OK, so pencils down. Okay. All right, so 
let's see what we have here. So A, efficiency is important to this person. Clean water, clean air, beauty, and legacy. Um, we see a lot of people definitely got the clean water piece and the clean air piece. So let's now take a look at the ones that um, were more based in what they think is wrong with the other person maybe than not what's important to them. So um, appropriateness is one that is vague and doesn't create clarity. So it is in just saying that, that appropriateness is important, it means that you're listening to what the person is saying and you're making an analysis that those are the things that are appropriate. So instead, so we don't want just a big theme of appropriateness, but we want to go, what is this person talking about? What's important to them that they're saying is the appropriate thing to do? What is it really about? And so those are the pieces that are about the clean air and beauty um, and legacy, those kinds of things. And then to say that control is important to this person, that's a piece of your opinion as you're listening to what it is they're saying. So they didn't actually express that control was important to them. And then limiting sprawl is their suggestion about what should happen. And so again, you want to be listening to um, not just basing it on what it is they, they think the suggestions are and the ideas that they think will fix it, but what's important to them about those ideas. And that will help um, people take ownership of what they want and then be able to come up with suggestions that are based in, in their values and what's important to them. Okay. So I just, I'll just back up for a second. The thing about control, often when we're teaching this, a lot of people select control. They listen to someone who sounds like they just want to be in charge of everything. Yeah. The truth is when we're in conflict, all of us want to be in charge of everything because we know exactly how to fix it to make things work for ourselves or, or the things that are important to us. So. Control is almost never a value um, because usually it's us. Um, usually it's us listening to them and saying, "Oh, they just want to be in charge uh, of everything." So uh, what you want to listen to is, if you're hearing they want to be in control, if they were in control, what goals would they meet? Not what would they do? They would limit sprawl. That's what they would do. But what, what goals would that meet? And the goals that them being in control and them limiting sprawl would meet would be the clean water the clean air, the beauty, the agricultural legacy, and so on. And, and those, those were what the values are. That's the stuff about what's underneath what it is that they're saying they want. OK, so uh, again, coming back to the other person, we'll read this again one last time just because I want you to be practicing. We're trying to, it's kind of tough to practice these things by webinar. But if you want to not look and instead write while I'm talking, listening to me talk, what are the values you're hearing as I say each sentence, right? So you've heard this before, but listen again, right? What are the values that you're hearing? It's fine for you to sit there and say you want to protect the agricultural character of this county while you've got your retirement account nicely squared away. But the farmers who've been farming their whole lives are ready to retire and don't have a fund. Their fund is their farm. You show up here with those maps drawing arbitrary lines, and you have no idea whose lives you're ruining. If you downsize, downzone this country, county, you'll crush their property values. Not only will they not be able to sell it to developers, the price they would get to sell it to other farmers will fall through the floor. And their kids, who are just getting started in farming, won't be able to leverage the value of the farm for credit to buy farm equipment because the land won't be worth anything. That's a hell of a way to protect the agricultural character of this county. So here we go. Uh, fairness, raising values, property value, opportunity, listening, young farmers, security, character, and awareness. I'll give you a chance to put your ideas in. Mm -hmm. OK, pencils down. Let's take a look. So we had uh, fairness. Yep, several of you said that. Um, property value, yes. Opportunity, security, um, and awareness. So it looks like not a lot of folks said awareness. So let me just touch on awareness for a second. When the person is saying um, this, these lines about you don't understand 
what it's like for these other folks. You're coming and making decisions, and you don't have an understanding of the impact of your decision on these other people's lives. That's where awareness comes from. The person saying, I want you to understand what it is that's going on. You need to have awareness about that. So that's where awareness comes from. Let's take a look at the other ones um, that we wouldn't use. So raising values looks like nobody said that, right? No one said that. Yeah, so that's your assumption about what they want. They actually never never said that. They talk about protecting property values. That was the value. But raising values is not um, something they articulated. Um, listening they didn't say at all. And so here's a tricky thing. Sometimes when someone is showing up and saying, you have no clue, they're articulating that understanding and awareness is important to them. Um, and what we hear is, oh, they want to be heard, they want to be listened to. But they haven't said that. So we need to be careful that our idea that, oh, if people were listening to them, then they wouldn't feel like the other person has no clue. And so then we stick listening in there. But they didn't say, uh, they didn't show up saying, well, I think we should have dialogue and really hear each other out, or you need to hear where I'm coming from. Um, so that's why we wouldn't have listening. Um, in as a value. Young farmers is a group that they mentioned, um, but that's not a value. So the question would be, what do they want for those young farmers? Well, they want security. They want property value. They want opportunity. That's the value. The young farmers is a group of people. Just like if I'm talking about my children and the fact that I want safety and security for them, my children wouldn't be the value. The safety and security would be the value. Um, and then character, again, this is, uh, we threw it in there because sometimes we hear a word, um, but it's vague and we don't know what's important to them. Um, and so we want to be careful that we don't just grab it because it sounds like a value, the character sounds like a value word. We don't just grab it and say, oh, that's, you know, that's their value. We're, we still need to be listening for what is it that they're saying is important. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look at uh, the things, the topics. Okay. So we're going to um, avoid reading it this time, but now you're looking through what are the things that people are talking about. And again, you want to keep in mind this grinder that the word should not blame anyone. It should be something the person said they had conflict about. It shouldn't take anyone's side. It shouldn't set up a yes, someone should, or no, someone shouldn't. So let's see what we have. We have A, pollution, B, zoning. C, limiting development, D, grandkids, and E, services. So take a minute to um, pick what the things are that this person is saying they have conflict about. OK, so, um, so we have the poll here, and we're ready. So pencils down. We're ready to see which things actually were the topics. And we have, OK, so we have B, zoning was a thing that the, the person is saying they have conflict about, and then also services. So um, we got pretty good numbers on zoning, very well, very good. You're awesome, as the dog is telling you. So let's see what is um, about the topics that were not there. So we have the topics grinder on the left-hand side. So you can compare the things that weren't topics against the grinder. And so pollution is a loaded word. So that's going to fail that where it's blaming someone. Um, and then limiting development, this is setting up a yes or no and taking a sign because of someone's suggestion about what should happen, not specifically a concrete thing. And then the grandkids is going to fail at the top of the grind. It's not something that they're saying. It's not a thing that they're saying that they're having conflict about. So although they mention the grandkids on what they hope for, and as you're working at working on understanding those feelings and values related to that piece, you're definitely going to listen for. But there's not a concrete topic there with the grandkids. OK. So um, let's take a look at the next one. So this is a person talking about the impact of downzoning on Farmers, and we won't read through this whole thing again, but now we're going to take a look if we can put the little quiz up there and the choices uh, for the topics that we're hearing here. Development, <coughs> credit, zoning, down zoning, protecting farmers, price of farmland. So go ahead and make your picks.
while you're picking, I wanted to say something else about the process. Um, some of the things that are not topics may eventually become topics in this conflict. And so what we're trying to do is we're with people each moment of the way. So we don't know yet what they're going to tell us 10 minutes from now. So when we're saying, you know, at this point in time, from what we've heard, such and such is not a topic, um, that's because in these scripts that you're looking at, that has not yet been articulated as a topic or as a value or, or as a feeling. Um, but as we keep listening, it's possible that as we find out more, those things become topics. And so the idea is we're with people in the moment hearing what are they saying right now. And as we identify and hear what they're saying, then more and more becomes clear and there may be more topics added. Clearly, this particular conflict was very complex and had you know, several people involved and had a lot of different perspectives. Um, and so uh, we're simplifying it with two different perspectives here for the purpose of, of learning. But it's clearly more complex than this. So from what we have heard in these two, this dialogue that we've got going on right now, the topics are, take a look, the topics are credit, which no one had. That's interesting. Uh, zoning and price of farmland. So I want to say something about credit that's sort of interesting. I think one of the reasons we probably are not hearing credit as a topic is because it doesn't seem initially like they're fighting about it, right? So the other person wasn't saying, geez, I don't think farmers should have access to credit. I want to keep farmers from having access to credit. But this person right here is saying, um, here's the problems in our community that are manifesting themselves around this conflict we're having. And one very clear one he's saying is um, credit and people's ability to access credit is this thing that's in influenced by these decisions we're making. And so we need to figure out what to do about credit um, in our community. So that's why we've got credit up there as a topic. Um, and then let's take a look at, uh, what, and I'm going to come back to talk about credit as a topic in this particular conflict, actually. Um, and I'm going to come back and I'm going to uh, look at the topics grinder. So development um, at this point is, is not specific, it's vague. So something may come out of that idea of development. Um, something may come out of that idea of development as they continue to have the conversation. But right now it's a very broad, sort of vague concept, not specific and concrete. Downzoning sets up yes, no. Yes, we should downzone. No, we shouldn't. Um, so again, we're trying to frame the topics in a way that, um, so while zoning is a topic, and we can think about several different solutions to zoning that meet the needs that people have articulated, downzoning is one possible solution. And so we're not putting words in as topics that are one possible solution that some people want and other people don't want. And protecting farmers um, is more of a value than anything else. It sets up a side. It's not specific. It's what this person wants. It's not a neutral topic in their conflict. And so that concept gets captured earlier on when this person, when we had that concept of protecting farmers gets captured in um, their values of opportunity and security and awareness and their feelings, which I'm not going to bounce all the way back to, of protective. Unless you remember, one of their feelings was protective. And so um, sometimes you'll hear something, they'll say, but they said something about protecting farmers, and so why wouldn't that be a topic? Um, it may be that in that concept, there isn't a topic yet. Uh, we're listening for what were the feelings and values in it. And the topics that we have so far that are associated with this person's interest in protecting farmers would be credit and price of farmland. Those are tied directly to that, but they're neutrally framed. So it looks like Erica is answering um, some other questions here. Um, so here's one of the interesting things that I wanted to say about this. Oh, we're about to go on to another conflict. So let me just say a few things about this particular uh, zoning public policy issue. And so this comes out of a real um, life scenario, as I said, that, that we did recently. So um, because we sort of listened to what everybody was raising, certainly zoning was um, the really kind of obvious topic that they were going to go forward and make a decision about in, in the context of this facilitation. But because credit came up as a separate topic, one of the outcomes of the facilitated dialogue that happened was that several people, in fact, several people who had been on opposite sides of the initial issue, decided to work together to find other ways to um, bring a credit to especially young farmers who didn't have a lot of collateral and who didn't have a history of farming. And so there's several apparently creative strategies out there that are implemented by states around the country. 
Um, and because we listened to all of the pieces, not just the really obvious stuff about zoning, credit came into the conversation, and this group walked away with not only solutions related to the zoning issue they came in with, but also to this question about credit and, and how uh, farmers in their community had access to credit. One other thing that I wanted to say in terms of people asked questions about how this gets used, and again, we're going to do a summary of this uh, when we get to the end of today's session, but while we're on this issue of this particular public policy um, conflict, um, uh, one of the things that we did was we used the values in this case. Um, we did a lot of listening, and we took the values. Where are my values? Here's some values. Um, <clears throat> We took values from the 25 people that were sitting around the table, and we made a very transparent list of the values that we called the goals that the group had um, in order to uh, resolve the issue. And so very transparently, everybody together identified their goals. We were using this concept of value, listening for values, listening for what's important. Um, and then we had that set of values, so when they started doing the brainstorming about what were some possible outcomes, um, we framed the brainstorm as, what ideas do you have that could meet this joint set of values that you've all identified? And their list of values were not all agreed upon. They weren't values that everyone had. Everyone's values were up there, but, they were, uh, but there were some values that were up there that belonged to one person and not to another person. But jointly, they created this values list. And then that was used both to brainstorm and develop solutions. And then later, we used it to narrow down the solutions into um, uh, the ones that they, they, they used it to prioritize the solutions they wanted to go forward with. Um, and I'm just going to transparently, Dr. Eric, I think because of the time, oh, it makes sense for us to jump. I'm going to jump to, um, so I'm not sure this is a question for the cadre folks. We have another um, example in here. And um, I don't know if it's possible to put it in the recorded version. Um, that people can access online uh, if we don't have, it seems like we don't have time now to go over it. Marshall, is there a way to do that for people to have access to this if we don't talk about it now? Um, we would need to uh, spend a little bit of time with you and and record something related to that. Okay. Um, the, well, we'll figure uh, out if we can do that. <laughs> great. The full PowerPoint will be accessible to people, but it won't be, um, we need to spend a little bit of time to figure out how to actually merge it into the content if that's something that you wanted to do. Okay. So what I'm going to jump to, we want to make sure that we have time for um, this conversation about how, uh, how does this actually get used, and then we also want to make sure that we, we leave some time at the end for uh, questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, um, so just one of the things that we want to highlight before we go into this next one, this was uh, just to be fully transparent, I think we've said this as we've gone through, we find this particular skill to be uh, extraordinarily useful. We find it to be the foundation on which absolutely everything we do, all of our interventions and the mediations we do and the facilitations we do um, are grounded in inclusive listening. And so when we were invited to do a webinar, we felt like, this was kind of the most valuable thing that we had that we could offer uh, to, to, this, to this webinar. The trick is we've never really tried to teach inclusive listening uh, via webinar. And the reason is, as you can see in this dialogue that we're trying to have, is it's a sort of subtle skill and sort of complex. And, um, and our concern is that if people don't have a full understanding of it and then go try to use it, um, it might backfire, and it feels like it's not working, but it's not necessarily the skills that aren't working. It's just that it takes time and practice um, to really have uh, a full understanding of it and to kind of feel comfortable with being able to use it seamlessly. So, um, so we are happy to share it, and we're happy to um, talk now about the various ways that we use it. Um, but we also want to give it with this caveat of it took us years to perfect it, and it takes people years to you know, sort of kind of continue to practice it with um, extensive training. And so we encourage folks to sort of, if you really want to use it and incorporate it into your work, to come back and look at these webinars, to um, access training that we do if you can, to find us at conferences if you can do that, um, so we can continue to support practice and learning in the skills and especially in, in the subtleties of it. So having said that, um, 
and we're going to talk a little bit about the various ways they incorporated, and you might find ways to incorporate uh, inclusive listening into your work even beyond the ones that we're going to articulate. Okay, so um, you want to be really paying attention to when you use inclusive listening. It's not really going to be very helpful if you don't say back what you heard. So that takes practice to not just hear it and you can see filtering out what actually was expressed, but then also how do you say it back in a way that doesn't point out the blame, that doesn't take a side and that sort of thing. So it's most effective when you use it while you're reflecting back. It helps the speaker feel heard and understood. Um, and it does take more training and practice to be able to do it in a way where you're not taking sides. And then as we saw earlier, and I'm sure you had questions that you might want to ask even in these last um, examples, but you'll hear people talk about things or say things where you go, well, wait a minute, what's that about? Or maybe that needs to be unpacked. So uh, open-ended questions is a good tag team skill to help work on understanding to unpack the blame language insult and then help people get clarity. I'm going to take these ideas and just give a quick example from earlier. If you remember, we had the IEP meeting and the mother who was talking about the mornings, getting Daniel moving in the morning. So the reflection to her um, might have sounded something like, so using the feelings, values, and topics, um, that she had articulated, what we might have said to her would have been, okay, so it sounds like you feel overwhelmed and exhausted, um, and the mornings are particularly tough, and right now you're looking for understanding and recognition of what it takes to make these mornings work, and right, and right here you're feeling insulted and judged. Um, and in terms of communication, it sounds like you're feeling blamed, and you're looking for support and awareness um, going forward. Is that right? So if you hear, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the ideas of reflective listening, you say back what somebody said, but if you hear in that reflection that I just gave, almost all of it was grounded in the feelings, values, and topics. I wasn't just reading off lists, but I was putting my sentences together with feelings, values, and topics as the, um, the sort of the foundation of that reflection. And then I might follow up by saying, um, can you tell us more about mornings, what happens in the morning, right? And so that's the open-ended question that gets us to that next place. Okay, so then um, other, uh, so other uses. So the fundamental uses, uh, we, we're using it all the time, using reflective listening. We're asking open-ended questions to get, to get more, more solutions. I think I gave the example earlier of before we even start talking about possible solutions, we make sure people feel heard. So I was giving the example of that mother and her feeling heard about how she felt judged and blamed and alone before we moved on to talking about what are some solutions in terms of services that could you know, help, with, help the family, um, made her more open to being able to talk about those services. Um, so some other, other pieces, uh, we use the values, the goal language, um, to generate ideas about possible solutions. So it sounds like you're looking, you're saying that accountability is important to you around this project. What ideas would help you get the accountability you're looking for? So you hear how we're coming back now to these values people said were important, accountability. Project would have been the neutral framed topic. And we're asking what ideas would you have to get the accountability you're looking for. So that's that piece that opens up possibilities grounded in the value as opposed to grounded in what's wrong with the other person and how to fix them. Um, taking that a step further, people might have talked about uh, very different values. So. Uh, this idea of win-win, uh, um, this was actually out of the example that you didn't get to see, but parents who have conflict about what food their children should be eating. Uh, so in terms of food, what ideas do you have that could ensure the good taste you are looking for and, the support, and support the nutrition and the health that you're committed to? Right, so you can imagine what this conflict was like. You know, uh, we need to give them, you know, more vegetables and only kale and primarily tofu and the other person's going, that stuff's nasty and they're not going to eat anything because that's so gross, right? So we're listening for what the, what the values were um, and uh, the values on the tofu and kale side uh, were about the nutrition and health and the that stuff nasty side was about good taste. And so then we asked this question, so in terms of food, what ideas do you have that could ensure good taste you're looking for and support the nutrition and health you're committed to? So it sets up this question. I don't know what the answer is, 
um, when I ask that question. They've got to figure it out, but I'm framing the question in a way that brings their values into it, and then food is the neutral topic. Um, once people are considering a set of solutions, they think they have some solutions, you can use feelings to test those solutions. So the example here earlier, you said you felt afraid coming to work. If you applied all of the agreements that everyone's come up with here, would you still feel afraid? And so especially if, you have, if you're working with people who feel like they've probably made some progress on solutions, um, but you're not sure if there's real buy-in to it. Like one of the ways to check buy-in is go back to feelings that they said earlier. So not based on do we think it's realistic, do we think it would work for them, but bringing their feelings back in. Um, kind of evokes what it's like for them to go into that space and asks them to do a reality check for themselves of um, based on these new possibilities, um, will I still feel afraid? And then um, agenda items. So if you're using this, certainly if you're using it in the context of a mediation and setting an agenda for a mediation or for a, a meeting, uh, a facilitation, an IEP meeting, but even in general when you're setting up um, agenda topics for any meeting, you can use the topics grinder um, and, and think about, am I putting topic ideas on this agenda that kind of inherently assume a particular outcome or are loaded and blaming somebody in the room? And so um, the example here is it sounds like you're all saying that meetings, projects, and supplies are things to discuss today. Is that right? And that's out of listening to people. But you can use the concepts of how we frame topics um, in writing any agenda. So you're writing the agenda for the you know, PTA meeting or the um, special ed advisory committee meeting or whatever it might be. And there might be a lot of um, intensity around the, the meeting that's coming up. And you can take a look at your agenda topics in terms of the topic grinder to see, you know, are we framing these topics in a way that really opens it up so everybody feels like they can be part of this conversation. And so um, you would be amazed how your everyday life, while you know, we, we really do believe that um, more training is very helpful to help you practice. Meanwhile, watch some reality TV. You want to especially be listening to the things that you normally think are ridiculous. If you can work on understanding and not judging the feelings and what's important to people who you think are ridiculous, then, you know, that's pretty good practice. You want to listen to talk radio, again, not the shows that where you agree with all of their political ideas, but the people who you think um, are way off base work on understanding the feelings and values um, and things that they're talking about. I like to eavesdrop on conversations. So like when you're in elevators and you hear someone on the phone or when I'm in a store and a little kid is yelling at their mom about, you lied, mom, you said I could have the candy. You're not doing what you said. You know, I'm listening going, okay, so he's upset and follow through is important to him and he feels betrayed and the candy is the thing he's talking about. You know, so just in little ways like that, um, even when friends call you and they have problems, so if they're angry at you, you know, and if you can practice while someone's angry at you, kudos. Um, but especially when they call you to vent about things, use this as an opportunity to listen differently to friends and coworkers. And even, you know, when you say, how's your day? You know, generally we say, how are you doing? And then we keep walking. We don't really listen to, to the answer. But now you can use, when people answer that question, use it as an opportunity to listen what feelings are they expressed and what are they saying is important to them today. Um, so your everyday life is a great opportunity to practice non-judgment and listening to others. Who would have thought it? Feel free to reference this slide when your spouse or coworkers are wondering why you're watching reality TV in the office or at home or why that you're watching that trash TV. You can just reference this slide and say that we told you to. Okay, so um, we're going to wrap up here in just a second. This is just a little bit more about CMM. Um, we're really working on finding more ways to to create um, practice opportunities. <clears throat> excuse me for for folks to learn more about inclusive listening and. Um, in general, and so hopefully we'll have some of that soon. But here's our website, and then prisoner reentry mediation is one of uh, the main uh, one of one of our major uh, initiatives. Um, and so you can see more. You can see all of our initiatives on our general website. But our reentry mediation um, has a website has some stuff that's that's really specific to that work. And you can find us on Facebook where uh, Eric is posting stuff right now. Um, so uh, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I think right? Can we open this up for questions? 
Yeah, we do. I think uh, we're not getting questions in the box, and so what I would suggest would be that if you have a question that you would like to ask um, live over the phone, if you would press star six, that will unmute your phone and you can ask a question. Um, and then after you've asked your question, if you would press star six again, that'll take some of the noise off the line. So any questions? Um, we have a couple of people who are typing. Uh, Miriam Alizo asked, could we have an example of inclusive listening? So, yeah, so just to be clear about inclusive listening, right, so when we say inclusive listening, the example, the, what we mean is um, <clears throat> listening to someone say whatever it is they're saying, however they want to say it, and listening for the feelings, values, and the topics. So that's, that's, the, that's the term we're using to describe that. Um, so that's kind of what we've been teaching. Um, the examples that we've given are sort of ways that it could manifest itself in a conversation. You know, this this last little set of um, can I get back to it? You know, this this these two pages sort of give you um, how how to use it in practice. But inclusive listening, when we say that, what we mean is this listening and hearing feeling values and topics, and then incorporating them in the various responses. Um, so then it would be helpful to have a series of examples for both the values and the topics grinder. Um, Bob, do you mean, oh, <laughs> yeah, Erica, you, I, I'm not sure I understand what that, that question. So I don't know, Bob, if you want to get on the line and say it or if you uh, want to write more. Hello? Yes. Yeah, I'm here. Bob? Hello? Yeah, were you going to ask your question? So someone just unmuted, and it sounded like they had a question they wanted to ask. Please proceed. Oh, it's Bob. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK. Yeah, uh, what I was thinking about was just a series of examples that you could uh, portray uh, unpacking topics from values uh, in more examples. Okay. Yeah. So you're, are you you're asking about like how do we distinguish topics from values? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Well, for example, using like the examples that you used, maybe having some more of them with some um, examples of what the topics would be and what the values would be, so we could unpack them. Yeah. Um, so I think you know what we'll try to do again. I'm, this this technology is uh, is sort of sort of newer to us. We do have a, that other one. It's the it's the conflict between parents, and maybe I'll work with Kadri see if we can um, can can sort of walk through that other example. Um, I would just quickly say what you want to think about is the topic is the thing people have conflict about, and you want to name it in a way that doesn't take a side. So the example will be food. And the values are what people want about that topic. So for example, if I'm the parent who wants to feed the kids kale and tofu and spinach and no sugar, um, then what I want is about health and nutrition. And if um, my kid's father is the one who wants the kids to have fun with food, you know, go to McDonald's and have a good time and be able to eat in any culture and not be restricted in terms of meat, um, then his values might be around um, inclusiveness and culture and enjoyment and convenience, right? So those are the things he wants around food and the nutrition and the health are the things that I want around food. And then I gave that example of how you could pull both of those together. So food is still the, the topic that is uh, neutral. And then our values are the ones you're going to want to tie together here in this, you know, this example here about generating win-win um, ideas. So the values are generally the things that we want. Um, out of our goals, out of the situation, and the topics are the things that we could make a plan about. And we'll try to get, um, we'll try to see if we can find a way to post this other example that we were ready to walk people through. Okay, this sounds good. So we're uh, we're coming up on time to 
wrap this up. The full PowerPoint is available on the Cadre site, and uh, I believe that if you uh, thumb through that PowerPoint, you'll in fact get to the, um, the additional example slides. So you won't have the benefit of, of hearing Lorigan and Erica talk about them, but you will be able to kind of see um, how the whole thing works. Um, I want to really uh, appreciate uh, Lorig and Erica really plowing some new ground for us. And so uh, we have historically had webinars where there's been a presentation and you know, an opportunity to ask questions, uh, but we've really been aware that there, um, that uh, the limitations of the technology and the absence of the opportunity to practice or to kind of see if there's a way that you can have the experience of using some of the concepts. And so this really, um, has plowed very new and fertile ground for us. So in addition to the, um, to the superb content that was presented and the um, obvious command that uh, Lorig and Erica have uh, around inclusive listening, it's really very, very grateful that they took the chance to, to do this practice stuff. And I think it's really been, uh, I'm certainly speaking for myself, very useful. So thank you very much, uh, Lorig and Erica. Um, a, a few words. So, a few words about upcoming cadre webinars. Uh, we're pleased to announce that our own Richard Zeller and Amy Whitehorn will provide an update on dispute resolution national trends. Uh, eight years of APR Section 618 data on February 6 from 11:30 to 12:45 uh, Pacific Standard Time. Many of you are aware that we have for some time maintained a, a longitudinal national database that really tells us what's happening in the country related to uh, use of due process hearings, use of mediation, resolution meetings, complaints. It's fascinating to look at the trends and to drill down into them. And uh, Dick and Amy spend an enormous amount of time doing that, thinking about it. So. Uh, it promises to be a very interesting and entertaining webinar. Um, we'll also uh, are in the process of planning another webinar for mid-March, and we've not yet, uh, we would expect to be able to announce the topic and presenter uh, on February the 6th, and of course the information both about the upcoming webinar, about, uh, about today's webinar, um, is all available on the Cadre website. So again, I want to thank Erica and Lorig uh, and, uh, and all of you for joining us today for your questions, your participation, and your attention. We will send out a survey to everyone who registered asking you to please evaluate today's webinar. We'd very much appreciate you taking the time to complete it. And um, uh, so with that, I think that we are done. Thank you all very much, and uh, take care. We'll uh, look forward to uh, joining another webinar with you in the future. Bye.